So welcome everybody to a conversation presentation about civil pasture systems in New York and their contributions to capturing carbon. My name is Steve Gabriel and I'm here with my colleague and co-farmer Brett Chedzoy. We're going to uh, share the ball today and talk about civil pasture on our own farms and from our own experience and also uh, think a bit about the context um, with which uh, civil pasture can contribute to carbon capture. So I'll start us off and then I'll pass it off to Brett. This is a webinar uh, co-sponsored by the Cornell Small Farms Program, as well as Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, in particular, our uh, agroforestry program work team, which is a collection of individuals across the extension and university system who are collaborating on a number of different initiatives and focused on a number of different crops and systems within agroforestry. Uh, you can visit our website at cornellagroforestry.org where you'll find a gateway to all the other kind of websites and resources that we have that talk about the various aspects of agroforestry that we're working on. And these are by no means the only things, they're the things that, um, that we've all put our time, energy, and, and been able to be supported to explore. But agroforestry definitely encompasses a much wider breadth of practices and crops and systems. So this webinar series is ongoing. It's gonna come uh, at you at different points in the year. So you can see our schedule for 2021 here. If you visit cornellagroforestry.org and click on the events, you can find a link. Um, you'll get, uh, if you register, you'll get uh, notifications of the meetings uh, the week before, and you can join us for any of these. And if you can't join us live, you can always view the recording on the Cornell Small Farms YouTube channel or on cornellagroforestry.org on the main page um, by the, the subject area that the, the webinar is about. So with all that, uh, thanks for being here and we're excited to share uh, this piece of the agroforestry puzzle with you all. Uh, as we start, I wanna, as we're talking about land and we're talking about place and it's important to acknowledge where we're broadcasting from. So we're at Cornell University, I'm in Ithaca in the center of New York state and we're located on the traditional lands of the Goyankono or the Cuga, and New York State has a rich history of indigenous land stewardship. And I think acknowledging and recognizing and thinking deeply about that relationship as landowners, as land stewards is a really important piece uh, to taking care of land and, and taking care of our communities into the future. So this is a recent statement that was put out by the College of Agriculture and Life Science. And I hope that it continues to lead to more dialogue and conversation about the inner meanings of this, uh, this statement and, and the things that can lead from those conversations. So wherever you are in the world, your, your land base has an indigenous story and there's a really cool resource online to learn more about that. Um, it started out as just something that was focused on North America, but now it's really growing out to all corners of the world. It's just nativeland.ca and you can uh, navigate to parts of the world where you might live or work and check out information about the names and cultures of the people who are the indigenous inhabitants of that landscape. And uh, I presence this not only to recognize the land we stand on and, and are working to, to take care of, but also to tie it into agroforestry and the ways that we perceive and think about landscapes. Because when we talk about agroforestry, it's often perceived as something that's brand new um, or something that's uh, an, uh, a novel concept. And it's actually, I think, um, in many ways bridging um, old methods and approaches and philosophies of land stewardship, as well as um, new ideas and new research and new techniques. And so it's a happy medium between. But what I wanna emphasize is especially in the Northeast, uh, the Midwest, the Southeastern US, the landscape that we often think of um, pre-European colonization um, was not a landscape that was uh, thickly just wooded and, and sort of a simple, dense forest, uh, as is often articulated or, or thought of or taught. It really was a mosaic of different habitats. And these quotes come from two really excellent resources. One is a paper called The Pristine Myth, which is listed down at the bottom of the slide. And another is a book called Changes in the Land, which talks about the relationships of the original inhabitants of the land and the landscape itself and the wildlife itself, and how that really shaped a multi-story, multi-layered mosaic where we had a mix and a continuum of dense forests, um, semi-open or sometimes savanna-like ecosystems, open prairies or grasslands, and a whole mix of everything in between. 
And that mosaic has, has largely uh, been simplified over time. Um, and what we're looking for that forestry often is to bring aspects of this mosaic back into the conversation. So where I come from is both uh, working for Cornell Small Farms Program as an agroforestry specialist, but also um, lucky to, to steward uh, 50 acres, um, which we half uh, have title to and half uh, lease. Uh, and we graze this and think about ways that we can do uh, forest restoration work in the context of farming. And so we look at different systems, including mushroom production, maple syrup, and silvopasture, of course, which is the focus of today, to think about ways that these things can interact and that we always are constantly farming in the image of a forest and thinking about reforestation as a goal. That's how our farm hopefully is left um, after we're uh, gone on to some other place. And so in that vein, our farm is... Um, is what many farms are like, especially in this part of the country. It's a piece of land that was uh, sort of cut up and divided. There's stark you know, edges between field and forest. There's not a lot of that mosaic feeling. Um, there's a lot of land that was sort of abandoned or considered undervalued or underutilized. And so we're really looking to value and integrate civil pasture into much of the landscape. And we do this in a way that is restorative in terms of what we see in terms of soil carbon, in terms of wildlife diversity, in terms of species diversity, in terms of the health and happiness of our animals, ultimately at the end of the day as well. So it's all the combination and the intersection of those things that are important to us. So this is a map of our grazing plan, which is uh, a nice thing to do in the winter, kind of sketch out how you're gonna divide up your paddocks and what the plan is, but um, it's, it's a plan and you go out and the plan changes every single day, every single season. Especially in the context of climate change, we can think about lots of changes coming um, where two, no two years have looked uh, at all alike as we've gone through our grazing over the past 10 years on this piece of land. So all the red boxes on here are what we consider our mainstay paddock grazing systems. You can see some of them are in open field. Some of them have a bit of wooded area and um, an open field and some have some, some denser forest, although the forest uh, density is, is quite varied among those paddocks. The blue boxes on there are the winter paddocks where we, we bale graze and, and keep the sheep for the winter. And the green areas are conservation areas where we'll only put animals in on very um, specific and, and short duration uh, events at the right time of year or the right season. So agroforestry, again, broadly speaking, is trees and crops or livestock, the integration of those things. Lots of different practices. The USDA names six practices. Um, researchers have documented hundreds of practices globally um, when we talk about integrating these things. We're going to focus on just one. So civil pasture is one type of agroforestry that specifically centers livestock as the main tool um, of how we manage the landscape. So there's a lot of definitions and we could simply say that silver pasture is at, at first the integration of livestock and forages and trees. What's helpful for me and my wife as we thought about our landscape is also to really define our own definition, which is really a reflection of our goals. So for us, silver pasture is doing ecological restoration work and creating what we like to call livestock habitat, because ultimately we're not looking for a uniform pattern of trees, a uniform pattern of species. We're not looking for every grazing paddock to be the same. We're looking for diversity across the whole farm. We're looking for the animals to actually experience something quite different as they move through the landscape. And we're looking for the landscape to be reflective of its own sort of um, small elements of diversity. And civil pasture can come from sort of two different main directions. We could start with areas that are dominant with woody vegetation, trees, shrubs, everything in between. And we can go through a conversion process where we open up the canopy, we open up the understory, we allow enough light down into the forest floor to promote forages, which we might just sort of see what comes up or we might do some seeding and some uh, soil prep and things like that or some combination of those two. We can also uh, engage with trees and pasture, which is really starting with open pasture and then uh, adding trees to that landscape. And I'm going to mostly talk in the context of our farm about the second part, the trees and pasture, and Brett's going to mostly talk about woodland conversion as, a, as some examples of how silver pasture can look in the context of carbon management. Last thing I want to emphasize about silver pasture is it is not just putting animals in the woods. And unfortunately, especially in the Northeast, we have a long history of kind of tossing animals in the woods and hoping for the best. And it's really important to emphasize that civil pasture includes 
rotational grazing includes uh, having animal interaction and then long rest periods and includes making sure there's sufficient food and forage in the areas that we're grazing so the animals don't turn to the trees, the roots, anything uh, else as a food source and thereby do damage. So all animals can do positive effect on the landscape and they can all do great harm. And so we have to be really careful about the way we approach that. So let's talk about climate, climate change, carbon, all these things. Um, the climate's changing. I think we can see that um, if we're working on the land, if we're experiencing these ebbs and flows of different things, if we're getting 90 degree days in uh, the early spring and then cold, cold nights uh, later on in the summer, um, all these kind of fluctuations, um, change is, is the only norm. Um, and it's gonna look very different in, in different parts of the country for sure. So silvopasture itself, I think is really a powerful uh, practice because it can both uh, work to sequester carbon to reduce sort of the impact of our current way of life, but it can also uh, help support farm resilience in the meantime in response to the conditions that we're already experiencing. And we see this already every year that we put more effort into civil pasture on our landscape, we increase that resilience. And I'll talk a bit more about that as we go with some specific examples. But back to habitat, we have to think about with our grazing animals what kind of spaces are conducive to their health, to the health of the larger landscape, and to carbon. And though, so this is really the, the landscape and the habitat that most cattle in the U.S. experience. And we can definitely uh, do the math and see the negative effects uh, on the carbon cycle, on the animal health, and on the environment. And we can contrast that. I'll, I'll borrow a picture from Brett that he'll probably show again because it's such a nice one of a farm in upstate New York, uh, grazing Angus beef in a habitat that's supportive of their health, supportive of environmental and wildlife health, productive and sequestering carbon. And at the most basic level, these two pictures really contrast what we're trying to, to move more livestock folks towards. So there's a big debate about there. We could uh, spend a lot of time getting into the nuances of, you know, um, are, are cows and grazing animals good? Are they bad? Are they contributing? Are they, are they a solution to climate change? There's a lot of noise out there. There's some good resources to check out and I encourage you to, to explore them, but I wanna share a few things, particularly with silvopasture. And I think one of the key things is when we add trees and forested landscapes to the grazing question, um, it starts to look really good from a carbon perspective. So grazing systems alone, uh, you could, you can, you can go different ways with that in terms of doing the math and seeing if it, if it works out or not. Um, but when you add trees, it's, it's really quite a game changer. So there's a great example that came out a few years ago of a, a managed grazing operation um, in Southwest Georgia called White Oak Pastures that did uh, incredible work to quantify and look at the potential of a managed grazing system intensively grazed and its carbon impact. And this is one of the few uh, ways that we can sort of quantify and say, yes, this is possible. Now, this is a particular place, a particular time, a particular management. It doesn't mean it can translate to every single type of ecosystem out there or every single type of context. So something you'll hear me say a few times is that context really matters. But it's a really good case study here. And it's one that was done, I think, uh, with a high level of integrity. A lot of other research is, is challenged because it's setting up conditions, but it's not necessarily looking at the animals in the entire situation of a managed farm. And that's just grazing. So we do know there's examples out there of just good grazing being net carbon positive. And that's mostly we're seeing the, the carbon being put into, into healthy soil. Where civil pasture comes in is it brings in both that below ground uh, carbon bank as well as the above ground carbon bank. So that's why when we add trees, the numbers start to look much, much clearer. So this is an old analysis of uh, prairie ecosystems. Um, done, but it, it's a good illustration of the, the fact that um, trees and forests generally have the majority of their carbon above ground. This carbon is in slower and more stable uh, forms. And they also contribute a lot to building fungal networks, which have a lot of uh, important roles to play in the carbon cycling and storage process as well. Versus grasslands and, and forage ecosystems, if we combine those, we get more below ground carbon, the majority of that showing up below ground. Uh, a slightly more a sort of fast and more volatile um, system that can be built up quicker in many cases. So we can think of the grazing component as the quick way to put carbon into the soil and sequester, and then the trees as the longer term storage that's a, a bit more stable. Now, it's just coming out really in the, in the past 
you know, five years or so, the real importance of fungi that actually, when we talk about carbon in the soil, where is it living? Where is it being cycled? How is it being held? It turns out that the, the fungus itself is doing a lot of that work, both in the storage and the retention of carbon in the soil. So when we talk about trees, we have to talk about fungi as a part of that. And there's ways that we can bring fungi in to a productive system to make sure it's doing, um, it's doing what it needs to do. When we talk about grasses, we really don't see the carbon benefits without the grazing animals as a part of that component. So it's not just the trees, it's not just the grasses, but it's also the fungi and the grazing animals in that specific context that starts to create an ecosystem that has that carbon storage capacity. And that's really what silver pasture is, is orchestrating all those pieces at the same time in your context on your landscape. So on a broad, uh, in a broad sense, um, if we look at silvopasture, pasture, one great resource is a project called Drawdown, which came out as a book several years ago. It's also a website where you can dig into a lot of the information. Hundreds of scientists from around the world pulling together data and sort of looking at and ranking different solutions to climate change in the context of um, their carbon uh, sequestration uh, potential. And silver pasture ranking very high out of hundreds of solutions in the top 10 or 15, um, arguably the top agricultural solution. Um, uh, there's some other land use and, and, and decision making solutions around here, but in terms of how we utilize and, and uh, make use of the land, silver pasture really showing up high. And it's not to say that it's important that one uh, thing uh, is higher than the other, but to really look at the potential of this and how it stacks up against other decisions of how we manage land is something we want to think about. But you know, all these elements of um, this list here are important for us to um, act on in terms of carbon reduction. If we look just at land use practices, this is a slide borrowed from a friend Eric Tonsmeyer. Um, who did a lot of the agroforestry analysis for the drawdown project. Um, we see silvopasture really ranking very high on the list of potential land use practices. And we see a lot of the most common discussion around regenerative or carbon farming sort of showing up towards this, this bottom left corner here. So yes, improved grazing, uh, rotational grazing, pasture management definitely is, is sequestering carbon, but you can see it's not even close to the level as, as what we look at when we think about silvopasture or many of the other practices in agroforestry that bring trees into the picture. If we look at the top level here, we have these very dense woody polycultures that are usually highly diverse systems, um, not often happening on um, hundreds or thousands of acres, but maybe happening on tens or, or dozens of acres. So much more intensive systems that also sequester. So again, all these systems being very important parts of the solution, but silver pasture really showing up um, quite high on the list. And again, it depends on your context. So looking more into the data, into the research, we see that context really matters. So here's 29 different sites practicing civil pasture. The carbon analysis shows they're a bit all over the map. All those green dots in there are showing um, the age of the uh, farm, where they're at, and, um, and what their carbon potential is. And that's a really important thing, too, is, is sort of the startup sequestration venture is very different than the maturing sequestration venture, which we'll talk about more in a minute here. So context matters. Here's an example of an article that you can find on the Association for Temperate Agroforestry website, specifically analyzing a pecan uh, cattle silvo pasture, and that having specific implications. And that's going to look differently. This is in uh, the Midwest versus if, that, if we were to do that in New York, because we wouldn't grow pecans very well in New York and the trees wouldn't grow very fast if they survived at all. So we wouldn't see the same values in terms of carbon, right? So that's kind of some big picture context. But what I really want to bring it back to is the motivation of the farmers, the folks stewarding the land and working with the landscape, which a lot of us want to uh, take care and think about carbon, but we also have to uh, sort of pay the bills and, and get the work done that the farm requires on a daily basis. So I didn't personally come to silvopasture just as a carbon sequestration motivation. I came to it um, for as, out of an interest of trees, a, a college career that included uh, studies of forest ecology and, um, and an interest in uh, ecological restoration as well as, as agriculture. But silver pasture really didn't enter our farm practice until disaster hit. So in 2016, uh, we're sort of down in the uh, right corner here of this, uh, this red blob. We had historic drought. We had the, one of the driest years ever on record. And we had that nice grazing plan that we made in the winter. We got around our first rotation and none of the pasture had regrown enough sufficiently to graze without doing damage. 
we're not storing carbon in that situation, right? And we're definitely going to do damage if we put the animals there. So we started to think about creatively about the different options we had. One of the things we looked at is all the sort of edges uh, on our landscape that had been underutilized, undervalued, that we hadn't even paid attention to. And all these areas in the little yellow boxes um, mostly were so thickly covered with brush that we didn't even know uh, what was there, uh, much less if it had any value uh, to the grazing system. And so we were fortunate that we had a breed of sheep, the Katahdins, that um, prefer browse, uh, woody browse, almost equally to pasture. And so we set them off. We, we switched our grazing plan to basically put them into these large hedgerows and, and utilize the, the fodder available in these hedgerows. And we were able to sustain them for 40, 45 days. And um, at the end of the season, we didn't see any real drop in our, in our carcass weights when we went to, to, um, to slaughter some of them. And, and, and that, that's just an indicator really of uh, not losing our sort of productivity or we didn't lose any animals to stress um, or to any other issues, you know, disease or anything like that. So we were able to maintain herd health and we were able to maintain our sort of productivity. But what was more eye-opening was the fact that we had missed out on an opportunity to really utilize and interact with the larger landscape and, and create a, a more diverse ecosystem along the way. So for us, it launched a process where we started to think about trees and woody plants and the interaction of them and animals in a very different way. Here's a willow windbreak that we planted very early on in the farm because it's a very windy site. And at that point in 2016, we were just looking for anything green we could feed to the animals. And we let them have it at the willow. We said, it, it can probably handle it. We'll, we'll let them give it a go. And what was interesting is they, they would eat it for a while and then they would stop. And, you know, them backing off of that was surprising because we thought they must be so hungry. They're just going to eat this day in, day out. But it was the tannins, as we learned later in the willow, that, that slow down and ultimately uh, encourage the animal to stop consuming willow. And those tannins, interestingly enough, not only uh, uh, curtail the appetite, but what they're doing is creating an inhospitable environment in the rumen for parasites. And they're also reducing the methane output. And research has shown um, th both of those benefits from feeding animals high tannin forages. So without even knowing it, we were starting to think about the application of tree fodder, not only as something um, in a drought situation that really helped us get by, but also something that potentially had some medicinal benefits for our animals. So for us, the motivation has been to think about the, not the nicest pasture, not the nicest forest on our landscape, but really the marginal edgy uh, stuff that's overgrown and, and, and underutilized as a place to start our civil pasture work. And for us, the motivation has been largely to think about emergency tree fodder, shade and shelter for our animals and how the trees can provide all those things while also sequestering carbon in the landscape. And that really provides us with a lot of resilience because whether we have an excessively wet year or an excessively dry year, we have excellent production on the trees. The trees are pretty resilient to both of those extremes. So just a couple examples here. Here's the uh, a swale that we dug. Here's some willow going in that initial hedgerow. And here's some of the pop, uh, excuse me, the black locusts going in that you saw in some of the images there, you know, planted in 2013. By 2017, they were 30 feet tall. Uh, wild as bushes, lots of pruning to do, lots of thinning, lots of fodder available, just as a natural way to manage healthy trees in the long term. And they're doing great today. So those two systems now form a civil pasture where we have a paddock in between where the sheep can graze and we can clip or give them access to the trees depending on the height and the time of year and things like that. For both a dose of that sort of medicinal high tannin forage from the willows and the high protein uh, content from black locust, right? So we're growing our fodder, we're growing our food alongside the pasture and we're managing the two together. And then those willow are planted on swales, which during extreme rain events, this was after a four inch rain event, capture that water that would inundate the pasture that would cause erosion. It holds it there, it lets it soak into the soil and it reduces those issues as well. So when I started working on the Civil Pasture book, this is what really got me excited, is to think more creatively about fodder, and think about its benefits for the farm landscape and also um, think about its benefits for carbon. So I thought about different tree species and it's easy to list just dozens and dozens of species, but I was really interested to think about trees that had these qualities you can see on the slide. Research is fodder, like a long standing relationship to animals, um, adaptable species that we see in different parts of the world, different ecosystems, different elevations, different microclimates, trees that are fast, fast excuse me, fast growing and easy to propagate. 
And then trees that also have some secondary benefits or some secondary products. And so I pushed a lot of sort of potential species through that, that sieve. And, and these four popped out as really clearly showing up in many different parts of the world, many different ecotypes. Um, black locust, uh, very particular to our part of the world, but um, a lot of analogs for some sort of fast growing nitrogen fixing, high protein uh, tree. So if you're in a different part of the world, you could find some kind of analog to that. But mulberry being one of the most common fodder trees globally, poplar and willow showing up on almost every uh, continent, especially any, anywhere there's temperate trees growing, we see these trees showing up. So these four species really could be the backbone of not only a productive fodder system, but also something that's incredibly productive at sequestering carbon because they're fast growing and they have a lot of potential in that realm as well. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, there's been research and promotion of using especially poplar and willow as uh, emergency fodder as supportive uh, forage for grazing animals for a long time. And there's interesting dynamics that happen about the ways that fodder can maybe outlast nutritionally grasses as the season wanes, or it can be they can be first onto the scene, or they can fill in the gaps in the summer slumps that we have in hotter climates. There's lots of different ways that fodder can help increase our resilience from that perspective. And so for the past two years on our farm, we've been treating our trees like our forages. We've been doing analysis. We got a SARE grant to do a bunch of testing. Um, we have the initial results of that. Um, first year on our website and and uh, and you can check that out and we'll have the second year uh, this summer later this summer but we really looked at not only the trees we would planted in the landscape but also the ones that um, were showing up like honeysuckle that um, we love to hate sometimes because we call it invasive but it's a plant that's in the ecosystem and it needs management to shift the dynamic and grazing animals are very cost-effective vegetation control and what we found though is that honeysuckle actually you know, provides a lot of trace uh, minerals and things that not uh, all the other tree fodders have. And that's really what woody plants often bring to the table is a lot of minerals and, um, and nutrients that aren't found as abundantly in our forages and our grasses and things like that. So when we come to the carbon perspective, um, there's a lot of different ways we could do the math and think about it, but I'll just share kind of the way our farm has been chewing on these numbers and thinking through. This is a table from um, this U.S. Department of Energy publication. It's a bit old, but um, but it's a valuable data set and that the numbers probably haven't changed. This was a specifically doing some math around carbon sequestration of urban and suburban trees. So essentially open grown trees, not dense forests. So there's some baseline numbers of what carbon sequestration can look like from an individual. And these are the numbers from uh, fast growing trees. So we, they, they would divide the, the chart into fast, medium and slow growing trees. So the trees we're mostly interested in on our farm for fodder are kind of fit all into that fast growing category. And so here are some of the numbers we can work with over, over a 20 year period. So if we think about, you know, this is the impact of, of one tree um, planted on an annual basis. And then of course we accumulate a bit more, this is pounds of carbon every year. So we're accumulating just 40 pounds of carbon after year 20 on an annual basis, but cumulatively we're up to 424 pounds of carbon, right? So not insignificant per tree. We start to extrapolate that out and say, okay, well, what does it look like if I plant 10 trees or hundred trees or a thousand trees? What is that gonna look like over time? What's my annual rate? What's my cumulative rate of sequestration? So those numbers start to get a little bit nicer looking and we have to convert them to tons of carbon, right? Which is what we're after. So. It gives us a picture of how many trees am I talking about planting on my farm to make an impact? Well, that can come from a lot of different sort of angles. So here's an example of working through the, uh, the numbers and the sort of calculations they have there and actually looking at a situation on our farm, which is not a high density silvopasture. pasture. It's actually a pretty mixed use space. We have our greenhouse. We have an orchard in here now. The aerial photography is pretty old there, but it's, it's mostly treed, um, but not as dense as it could be. It's about 0.65 acres. We planted a, just over 200 trees and there's about 180 still going. And it's just about seven years old, not too, not too uh, old. And so when we do the math, we think about well, who survived and um, what their annual sequestration rate was. And so what are they gonna give this year? They're basically gonna sequester about a ton of carbon. So that's pretty good. Um, if we translated this uh, under an acre to an acre equivalency, it's about one and a half per acre. And that's not including the carbon that we're sequestering from grazing um, over time, which, which Brett will put some numbers to. So we could add one or two tons of carbon from the grazing per acre uh, potentially into there. 
we're also need to think about potentially subtracting, you know, some fodder harvest. Although I'll have to say we, we feed out quite a bit of fodder and it's easily less than 10% of the total vegetation of that, of those trees. We're not, we're not taking a lot to feed quite a bit of animal from this. So, so that's, that's, that's a pretty good number. I, th I thought, you know, I said that that's not, that's surprising when I did all the math, but then I looked at my carbon footprint, you know, of my family. This is one of those calculators online. There's a, a million of these online. I just wanted to, to kind of play with that and think about that. Well, what's a ton of carbon mean in the context of what I what I emit every year, right? So I'm somewhere just over maybe 12 tons of carbon per year. Um, so that's not going to quite do it for me and not, not going to quite do it for my family, much less my community, right? So what does this look like on a bigger scale? Well, that's just one part of the farm. I want to point out here, though, too, I, I, these a lot of these calculators are also fundraising strategies. And they told me all I need to do is plant 787 trees um, on uh, on a half hectare, and and it only cost me forty seven dollars. Sounds pretty good. And then of course it gives me a link to donate. Right? Um, I'm curious where that number comes from, and I'm curious what types of trees they're talking about with 787. How long they're hoping they live, and how many survive? Right? There's a lot of questions in there, and um, I can tell you it doesn't cost just forty seven dollars to plant and maintain 787 trees. So I worked this out. I thought about, okay, what if I plant 100 fast-growing trees per year for 20 years? So over 20 years, I've planted over 2,000 trees. What's my annual carbon sequestration rate in tons? And what's the cumulative rate in tons? So after 20 years of planting, I've offset maybe four years. So that's, that's 100 trees a year, right? So we're getting somewhere closer, but it's still, there's a lot of trees that we need to put in the ground to really start to, to make a dent. And of course I can also probably do some things to reduce my carbon footprint, but that's just, that's just me on my farm with my family, right? So the numbers aren't important. What's important to understand and think about is what is our process of going from understanding that trees sequester carbon to actually getting trees in the ground and actually doing it at scale to a, a place that really works for the landscape, the farms, the farmers, and really for carbon. And that's something that's not always in the conversations that we see with some of the, the policy level decision making around carbon. So here's a calculator. Um, so just thinking about planting trees uh, in total, this is an example where um, this is a calculator that's available on silvapasturebook.com. We're hoping to add in carbon data, but right now it's really just tree planting data. It gives you some very basic sense of how many trees you might start with at what spacing um, and in what pattern. And then it assigns some different material and labor costs. And so to plant, uh, in this case, you know, um, a few hundred trees could cost, uh, if, you, if you wanted to pay yourself well to maintain them and to plant them, it could cost several thousand dollars to get this, this sort of thing going, right? So this is the reality. It's a contrast to what that fundraising website told me would take to, to, to plant trees and to maintain trees and to have them live as long as they do to offset my carbon footprint. So when I reflect on this and I think about and I have conversations with farmers interested in this, we have to create a system that really works for folks. And there's uh, incentive systems out there to plant trees, but there's a big need to think harder and deeper about starting from the piece of land, the specific context, the goals and the motivations of the specific farmers and the, the land stewards and how those things intersect into a design, into a, a planned process of planting trees and the associated carbon value. And this is something we're working on for our farm now is to look at different areas of the farm, decide where we wanna plant trees and then look at the, the carbon value and the cost of doing those sort of things. Rather than just donating to, to large entities that might throw a bunch of trees in the ground and hope they survive, I would rather see programs that pay the farmers to plant those trees and maintain them over several years. And then we need to follow up. So a lot of carbon offset programs that have tree planting, put the trees in the ground, they walk away and they don't even know if they've survived. They count their success because they planted the tree. So we really need a process to think about how we bring trees to the landscape and, and keep them there over a long time. And that's where I think farmers and land stewards become really important because they're invested in the landscape. They wanna see the trees um, succeed and do really well. So with that, this is the last slide of my, my piece to this. Um, this is just from a conference years ago where we had a, a breakout group talking uh, amongst different farmers about tree planting. And we talked about two things. We talked about what do we feel like were some of the challenges or barriers to, to all of us planting more trees? Um, what were our motivations for planting trees? And so these are some of the things that, that came up in that group um, that I think are really important to, to also focus on. So it's not just the cost 
but it's also knowing how to properly plant and maintain. Um, feeling a bit overwhelmed on the, the different species and how we could choose all those things, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and lots of different motivations, but I would encourage folks to think about like, what are your motivations for trees and how can that inform the decision-making process along the way? There's no wrong tree to plant in the landscape, but we certainly need to get going and, and get some more trees uh, planted into the ground. Over the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity to give over 100 presentations now on civil pasturing, but I've never really had the opportunity to give a talk on civil pasturing in today's context. And several years ago, I noticed that the conversation began to shift a little bit when this project drawdown and, and book that Stephen mentioned came out and I was like, oh yeah, and civil pastures are good too for sequestering and storing carbon. And I had always focused on how to make civil pastures, how to manage civil pastures, why civil pastures are good for us and our livestock. But this was kind of treading into new territory. And I acknowledge that some of you today honestly quite know quite a bit more about the carbon angle of civil pasturing more than I do. But when you read some of these conclusions from this book, it's it really should should, should cause us to open our eyes and, and say, wow, there's something to this. And so the question I want to start with this afternoon is how do or why do civil pastures capture and store more carbon than their treeless pasture or forest counterparts. This was a paper by Gabe Pent that a friend Mike Jacobson at Penn State had shared some months back. And uh, again, a confession here, this was the first time that I had seen the term overyielding used. You have to read it a couple times and then, and then it's like, okay, yeah, so it's the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So when we take uh, trees together with forages together with livestock, which is this unique agroforestry system called civil pasturing, then we're getting more on, on that same parcel of land. So I want to share some thoughts with you today in the context of a couple situations from our own family's farm in Watkins Glen, New York, Angus Glen Farms, where about half of our 500 acre grazing base is in some form of civil pasture. So I'm gonna focus on two types of civil pasture that I know, and I'll simply call these plantation civil pasture and wood civil pasture. And by the way, if you're aware of some more official name for like wood civil pasture, please feel free to share that in the chat box. So at first glance, both of these types of civil pasture look very much the same. And I even frame both of these pictures with the nice walnut tree. The picture in the left-hand side of the plantation civil pasture, that was a walnut that I planted about 33 years ago and when I was still a young forestry school student. And the picture on the right has a um, much larger walnut tree that's probably several decades older that a squirrel planted. So as I got to thinking about this comparison of plantation civil pastures to wood civil pastures, I came up with this list of strengths and weaknesses. And I, I have to stop for a moment and say, I hate slides with this much text on it, but I haven't had time yet to really devise this into something that's more like pretty pictures. Um, it's a work in progress. So when you look at the plantation civil pasture, you see that it has some strengths such as we can choose what species we want to incorporate into our civil pasture, but that comes 
and, and the weakness side that comes with a significant expense. Troy, you had commented in the chat box that um, some of the estimates that Steve shared seemed a little low. I would agree. Um, my personal experience is to plant a hardwood tree and get it to survive, and uh, especially in a civil pasture system where we have to worry about livestock and deer and other things. Uh, right now, we're experiencing a severe gypsy moth outbreak, and and that's just one more thing we have to worry about eating our expensive little trees. But it's it's the the cost is undoubtedly. Uh, very significant. In fact, I would I would estimate that probably to if I were to do it today here on our farm, I would probably be budgeting at least fifteen, if not twenty dollars per tree to get that tree up to the point where it could kind of um, get beyond the animals and and uh, fend for itself. Uh, one of the other strengths of plantation civil pasture is we can be planting trees into a pasture or a hay field or some prepared site where the forages are already present. Maybe that makes sense, maybe it doesn't, uh, because we also know that establishing trees in a sod environment is very challenging, especially when we have herbivores running around that want to eat those trees as well. And it's not just our livestock, it can be rodents, it can be rabbits, uh, but deer are actually the, the one that I would pay the most attention to because deer just love young trees that we put out there, especially when they're chock full of nutrients fresh from the nursery bed. So if you're not willing or able to protect those young trees, from all these uh, threats, then um, you might as well just dig a hole and stick your money in it because that's essentially what you're doing if you don't do it right. Looking at wood civil pasture, the, often nature put the trees there for us. I use the word free rather loosely. Sometimes it was also our predecessors, our ancestors that uh, they had some in set here in New York. There were a lot of farms that planted marginal ground to trees in, a, in the 1950s and 60s through a program from the DEC. And uh, but whether you know it was a, a natural natural existing stand of trees or trees that some somehow else came onto the landscape, somebody planted them there. The, the, it's great when we can start with free trees. But on the downside, we're, we're working with what's there. And uh, over the years, as we've talked about civil pasturing, one of the things that we always like to point out is that, and, and this is sort of to counter the, the argument of like, oh, you know, we're taking pristine woods and we're manipulating those woods into something different and possibly inferior. Well, when I think of civil pasturing opportunities in New York, what I'm really thinking of are the farm woodlots that have been high graded and that is cherry picked over multiple times. They have a flourishing understory of invasive shrubs or other types of noxious vegetation. And, but in those situations, we may, many of the good trees that were originally there may no longer be there. So, uh, and also I've seen over the past few years is Emerald Ash Borer a very significant forest pest, but there's many, many such pests on the landscape today and there'll be new ones. Uh, people came in into these like old pasture situations, old agricultural land that reverted to a mix of trees and shrubs. And guess what? One of the best trees is that came in on those landscapes, ash. So I have a friend who went probably seven or eight years ago, thinned out pretty much everything but the trees Unfortunately, most of those trees that were left behind at that time is ash, and now he's losing the ash trees. So um, we have to work with what's there. And then another strength of wood civil pasture is that, uh, you know, if we're starting with trees that are already large enough 
And when I say large enough, I'm thinking of trees that have probably already reached what we would call the small, small pole stage. That's to say trees that are at least a few inches in diameter, probably at least 20, 30 feet tall. Those trees often, especially with careful grazing management, we can go in there and start developing that into civil pasture and not worry about protecting individual trees from the damages that livestock may cause. Now there's a big asterisk with that. Um, one is what I've noted here, which is regeneration. So periodically, if we want to sustain that civil pasture system over time, we have to think about sometime during the life cycle of that civil pasture establishing patches of regeneration. I'm not going to get into the details of how to do that today, but when I say graze it carefully, what I mean is uh, most trees that are, again, of that size that I've described, that pole timber size, they can be quite resistant to livestock most of the time, but not necessarily all of the time. And a common example would be in the spring during sap flow, what we call uh, bark slip season where grazing animals could very quickly go in there and start rubbing on your nice three inch diameter sugar maples and the bark falls off. In fact, if you just sneeze, the bark falls off those trees. So we, we need to be aware of those things because you could put the animals in there in the morning, come back in the evening and uh, extensive damage has been done at that point. So uh, beware. And then uh, on the flip side, if, you know, to have a good productive civil pasture, we need to have a forage base and establishing forages in and amongst trees and stumps and slashes, branches and things that have fallen on the ground. That's, that's certainly easier said than done. Those of you that have done it know that it, it's, it's easier to do in a treeless environment than one that's full of these obstacles. So let's take a little closer look at these two situations, the plantation and the wood civil pasture. So here's an illustration from our farm of plantation civil pasture. And immediately we can start to see why drawdown and others point to civil pasture is a really good way to capture and store carbon because we have lots of herbaceous plants in there. We have lots of big woody plants in there. We're periodically harvesting durable wood products. There's a pile of locust fence posts in the foreground. And we're also um, capturing and storing carbon, not just in the plants, but in the animals as well. So, these are figures that I've used, um, or that I've come up with rather, for this situation in the context of our own farm. And these numbers, and you know, again, I'm, I'm throwing myself at your mercy to contend these numbers, but this is a combination of often citable figures combined with what I feel we do in an average year. Steve had pointed out in his talk that there is no such thing really as an average year anymore. Um, all of you that are farmers understand that. All of you that are land managers understand that. Uh, right now, things are seeming pretty normal around here at our farm. Last year, we had probably the worst drought in our history, certainly in our 20 years of grazing history. And Steve used an illustration from his farm in 2016. That was another memorable drought year. And of course, in between in 2018, uh, we were considering putting pontoons on our animals because it just rained so much. So the uh, what I'm doing here is making a estimate of the amount of above ground biomass that we're producing on average per year on a dry matter basis. And we have to, and I you know, it's important to point out dry matter basis because we start thinking about like, oh, you know, but I harvest whatever, um, you know, so many um, 
bales of baleage or cords or tons of firewood and stuff. Okay, but we, we need to get in on Ample's Tample's basis, which is the dry matter basis. So on our average hay field, we estimate that we grow about two tons per acre per year. That's in a fairly well managed two cut system with some liming and fertilizing. And again, when it rains enough, the yield for our pastures are a little higher than that. And that's in part because uh, we're going in and having the animals clip it more frequently than twice a year, like we're doing in our hay system. Or else it's the uh, grazing is, is a bit more regenerative for the soil health as well. So we feel that our pastures overall are more productive than our hay fields, um, at least unless we're going out there and uh, adding more inputs to the system like a lot of fertilizer. And then this one ton per acre per year, this is a very conservative statewide average estimate. And it's gonna be about the same whether we are managing this as silvo pasture or just for timber because in, in both of those cases, we're retaining roughly the same stocking per acre of trees. And I don't wanna stray off into silvicultural topics today, but when I'm talking about stocking rates, I'm really talking about this roughly 60 square feet of basal area per acre, that's how foresters measure stocking. And that is kind of the target when we're out there thinning out a stand that we're managing for timber to get the optimal growth. And it also seems to be a nice uh, a balanced stocking rate for getting enough sunlight in to grow these cool season forages, many of which are relatively shade tolerant and in some cases do better in the light shade and the cooler moister understories of civil pastures than they do out in a treeless pasture. Uh, which is by which is why by definition we think of them as cool season forages. So if you're paying attention to these numbers and you add it up, the conclusion is that the biomass yield is about three and a half tons per acre per year of dry matter compared to about two and a half for the hay field, or I'm sorry, two and a half for the pasture. The, you know this is a well rotationally well-managed, rotationally grazed pasture, two for a well-matched hayfield, or about one ton per acre for just growing it in plantation. And uh, Steve had shared a table with you about comparing the um, <laughs> yield or, or amount of wood growing under like different initial planting levels. I don't know how that I don't know how this figure here compares to Steve's, but mine is based on that kind of average state estimate that we use that we can sustainably grow about one cord or roughly, or I'm sorry, half a cord, which is roughly one ton of wood per acre per year. Um, so for this situation here, and, and again, this is a number that you're welcome to debate, but we, meaning this team of people at Cornell uh, and to an extent um, with some of our other neighboring universities, our, our Northeast Civil Pasture team is made up of folks from University of Vermont and Yale as well. But here in New York, we, we believe that there's roughly 2 million acres of these underutilized and often degraded farm woodlots that have, uh, um, well, sorry, I'm talking about plantations. That there's roughly 2 million acres of these treeless pastures that could be enhanced into civil pastures. And the, the official figure, I believe, for underutilized grasslands in New York State is, is quite a bit higher, but let's just focus on sites that are also good for not just growing grass, but growing trees as well. All right, so let's move on to wood soil pasture. Uh, so again, you can see a lot of things happening in this picture here. We've got the herbivores, we've got the forages. We've, uh, one of the first things I'd like you to notice though is that uh, 
this in this woods has been thinned to essentially remove the firewood quality trees that were intercepting sunlight and pretty much every tree in that picture is a what we consider a high quality productive tree. So there's, and there's a diversity of species. There's red oak, there's white oak, there's sugar maple, there's basswood, there's red maple, and a little bit of everything else mixed in. You can even see some hickory and uh, beech there in the background. So we, we like a little bit of everything in our civil pastures. And that's what nature put there and that's what we're gonna work with. And the same is true with the forage base. but one of the advantages that I believe that a wood civil pasture has possibly over its plantation counterpart is that there's, there's also a lot of uh, carbon there in all those extra stumps that were uh, left behind from when we harvested those firewood quality trees. There's quite a bit of slash on the ground. Slash is a term that we use to describe the, the kind of the coarse woody debris left behind after a harvest or a thinning operation. We have down trees. You can't really see any in this picture, but I know we have some nice dead standing trees out there, which we call snags. And, and that's uh, a, a important component of wildlife habitat as well. It's kind of the home for the critters and the insects that feed those critters. So uh, this picture here, um, you can see there's a lot of carbon going on and or a lot of carbon being captured and also a lot of carbon being stored. So let's look at the numbers. Uh, again, <laughs> expressing this on a uh, dry matter basis, so if we're matching that woods just for sustainable timber production, we're gonna be capturing about one ton per acre per year. And for civil pasture, using the uh, figures that I shared in the plantation slide, about three and a half tons per acre per year. So also we estimate that there is about 2 million acres of these farm woodlots that are ripe for this utilization of civil pastures versus just the farm woodlot that has been uh, cherry picked to the point of no return um, or has other health issues, you know, the ash died, the elm died, the something else died and the sunlight got in and now it's a, a impenetrable understory of honeysuckle or buckthorn or multiflora rose or all the above, or maybe beach brush native species can be problematic too. But when you take the 2 million acres that have potential from the wood civil pasture side and the 2 million acres that have potential from the plantation civil pasture side, that's a lot of acreage. And when we start talking about sequestering carbon, this isn't something that, you know, we're talking about maybe a few thousand acres or 10,000 acres. Uh, it's potentially in the two uh, millions of acres. And every one of you tuned in today understands that there's a lot of barriers to ever get anywhere as close to those millions of acres, much less even hundreds of thousands of acres. But I want to make this point because when we we're, we're thinking about land-based approaches to capturing and storing carbon, civil pasturing is an area which deserves more attention because the potential for it is very large just in New York State but the same could be said of any state in the Northeast and I, I think pretty much any state in the country where it rains enough to grow productive forages with productive trees. Uh, one of the things many of you have heard me present before in civil pasturing and heard me use examples from our family's ranch in central Argentina where it actually rains quite a bit um, also it rains about as much as here in upstate New York but because of other factors partly the seasonality of that rain and also the very coarse soils that are low in organic matter uh, 
the the civil pastures um, really really can can uh, be a game changer in terms of making that land more productive. So, what can we take away from these 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 points I've been making here? So, uh, one is that civil pastures can grow and. I'll use the word capture interchangeably with grow here, about the same amount of carbon, whether it's a wood silvo pasture or a plantation silvo pasture. That's assuming all things are equal. And I'm sure many of you are forming a thought in your mind right now of like, well, wouldn't woods be a little higher for this or maybe a little less for that? But essentially we, we could potentially grow about the same amount of carbon per acre in either of those scenarios. The second point is wood silvo pasture probably stores more carbon at the same age in its development, primarily due to higher initial stocking of trees per acre. Now again, I didn't want to stray off into a silvicultural talk today, but I could have put some good pictures up there that show the succession of a naturally occurring woods. And so this, this statement is based on this premise that uh, when we create a plantation civil pasture by planting trees, we're normally planting a relatively low initial stocking of trees per acre, perhaps up to a thousand trees per acre, but more typically hundreds of trees per acre. When nature establishes a uh, young woods, that usually is more in the magnitude of 100,000 seedlings per acre, um, or 100,000, I should say, woody stems per acre, because today with the impacts of deer, that could be a combination of trees plus woody shrubs, usually invasive woody shrubs. But that land often seeds into very high densities of woody stems per acre. And, but if you look at a young pole timber stand or a young sampling stand, um, one that hasn't been uh, disrupted by the presence of excessive deer impact and invasive plants, then you see this like almost bamboo thicket looking situation of very high stems per acre. Again, it could be as high as 100,000 seedlings or more per acre, and then thousands of uh, samplings per acre, and then, um, or tens of thousands of samplings per acre, uh, thousands of small pole sized trees per acre, and eventually um, the hundreds of more mature looking trees per acre that we saw in that previous slide of the wood silvo pasture. And what happens there is that because of that high attrition rate, the trees either succumbing to natural competition or us intervening at some point and thinning out the, that woods, much like we would weed a garden, we're leaving, again, a lot of biomass on the ground in that slash and in that root system and stumps. So I think that uh, if you were to look at a plantation civil pasture and a wood civil pasture at the same point, uh, meaning 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, the wood civil pasture probably has the advantage there in terms of overall carbon storage. Third point, civil pastures have additional advantages over just woods or pasture in that they probably have greater below ground biomass. I put a question mark here. Um, that screenshot there snippet is another paper that Mike Jacobson from Penn State uh, just recently shared, a paper by Andrea DiStefano and, and Mike. And it was to look at the literature, not just in the context of the Northeast, but everywhere to look at particularly soil organic carbon. And um, one of the takeaways from that paper is that uh, civil pastures tend to have a higher percent of soil organic carbon than pastures. 
um, but less soil organic carbon than woods. And but further along in the conclusion, it says uh, the results are all over the place. At least that's how I interpret the results, and it depends. Um, so um, I think we have a lot more work to do in that area to figure out really how does soil carbon, soil organic carbon, but also living plant biomass in the soil profile change as we move from one of these realms to another, as to say pasture to civil pasture to woods. Also, and I mentioned this earlier, one of the advantages that civil pastures have over say just woods is that we're also sequestering carbon in the form of livestock biomass. And that thousand pounds per acre per year, good luck finding that one in the literature or as a, a citable figure. This is based partly on my own estimates, but also on that of uh, some other very good grazing friends. And it knows I said up to, because it could be maybe a much lower figure of a hundred or a few hundred pounds per acre per year, or it could be um, perhaps in excess of a thousand pounds per acre per year. The thousand pounds per acre per year we felt was for kind of the, the um, kind of the whole herd birth to butcher system versus like just bringing in finishing animals and trying to optimize gains on those animals over a seasonal basis. And then finally, the wood civil pasture is also probably more profitable due to this fact that we're not investing huge amounts of money up front in establishing the trees. In forestry, we look at uh, forestry investments usually on a net present value basis. And if you take a dollar that you're investing today in a tree and you compound that out at even a very modest interest rate for decades, that gives you a big negative number at the end that you have to overcome with big revenues. Otherwise, today's value of that project is negative. Uh, and <laughs> that said, I believe, and we have ex uh, examples here on our farm where I think some tree species can be grown profitably as a timber cash crop. Black locust is one of my personal favorites, but that's a another story for another time. Nonetheless, not every tree has to pencil out in the black to merit consideration for utilizing it in a plantation civil pasture. Because as we all know, there's many other benefits, both tangible and less tangible of why we might want to plant trees. So, um, and that tree planting, especially when the the profitability might be a little bit more in question. I think that that lends itself well to a third situation, which I didn't cover today, which is enrichment planning. So earlier I said that many of our farm woodlots have been um, managed in the past or had events happen to them, such as pest outbreaks or storm damage or other factors, including trees dying of old age. and uh, because of that interfering understory vegetation and the selective browsing impacts of deer, we may need to intervene and go in there and introduce trees. And if I have to undergo that effort and expense um, or think of it as an investment, I'm going to pick trees that um, might not just be the same same trees that are already still there in the woods, but but other trees that maybe have been displaced. Uh, a, a good example would be oak is usually one of the first species to disappear in a mixed hardwood forest in this area because it was the sun lover that got its head up above everybody else and capture more sunlight. Consequently, it grew two or three times faster than some of the other more shade loving trees like maples around it. 
And so guess which the first trees were that left the woods when the friendly neighborhood timber buyer knocked on the farmer's door. It was the oak trees. So um, if I had that case where enrichment plan was justified, I would be thinking about restoring some of those species that uh, were previously lost or severely depleted. So finally wrapping it up and you know we've talked to a little bit this afternoon or started to stir the pot a little on ways that civil pastures can capture and store carbon, but we have to think about the offset benefits as well. And I believe this applies to all agroforestry systems, but particularly for civil pastures for all the reasons we've been talking about here is that we can be growing more of our food, our timber and other products, you know, um, animal fiber, uh, milk, et cetera, and um, nuts. Well, I guess all that falls under food, right? In our own backyard, instead of having to depend on some other part of the world or some other part of the country to grow it for us and then truck it here. So, and we can usually be doing this on land that is um, frankly not being used in a very productive fashion. Uh, so finally, I can never resist the opportunity with a captive audience to put in a plug for an event that we've actually wanted to do for a couple of years now. I think it's because of the situation that we were still in a couple of year, or a couple of months ago when we really need to be doing the, the groundwork and planning for this, like getting tour buses organized. Um, big events were being still canceled left and right and nobody was really willing to say hey when can we get together again in big groups and everybody feel comfortable and cram you all on tour buses and feed you lunch uh, you know we were going to try to do this in September but uh, the calendar is full at this point and I don't think there's enough time to pull this off and, and do it right so I think it's going to get shifted into summer of 22. 2022 but we'd love to bring you all here and take you out for a, a tour of some great civil pasturing farms here in the southern finger lakes area so we will be putting the full details for that up on the civil pasture forum that's the civilpasture.ning.com that you see at the bottom is is the details um, become clearer and clearer and i'll also say that Yesterday, we finally broke the 500 member mark to the Civil Pasture Forum. So congratulations to all of you for those that um, have joined that forum. By the way, we understand you're not gonna join the forum and get on there every evening and post a lot of stuff, um, but joining the forum will allow us that once or twice a year that we're doing something really cool and important, or at least that we feel is cool and important to share it with you and you don't miss out on it. We will also eventually post the link to today's recording and the subsequent recordings for this agroforestry series on the Civil Pasture Forum. That link will be to the Cornell Small Farms website that Steve mentioned. Uh, so if you wanna know when those recordings come out, join the forum and when we get it all up there, we'll let you know.